Good morning. Hello. I see everybody's got their coffee and is shuffling back to their seats. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Citizens Church. It's my honor and privilege today to introduce Pastor Dan. He's come up from Edson to, uh, to be with us as Pastor Pete's away. And I always enjoy when Pastor Dan comes up and shares his wisdom with us. He's, uh, he's been in ministry and uh, been doing missions work for over 40 years and still is doing uh, missions currently. Um, and I think I said he's up from Edson, so it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for braving the smoke and coming up this direction. Uh, he, I feel bad taking your joke, but he told me that he used to come from a little smoky area and now it's been upgraded to big smoky. So <laughs> here he is. We're excited to have him. Please uh, help me introduce uh, Pastor Dan. Welcome aboard. Thank you. I enjoy coming to this location. Uh, not only because I enjoy uh, your church, but um, my father was a pastor in northern Saskatchewan, northwestern Saskatchewan, actually about 20 miles, I'm going to put this up here, from the Alberta border, uh, not, that, not that far from Cold Lake, and he built many log buildings. In fact, he built a Bible camp called Silver Birch Bible Camp, which is still going up there, in the Loon Lake area, and then the, I think the first seven buildings were all like this. They were all log buildings and uh, still standing. So it, this is kind of like coming home. <laughs> so uh, very pleased to be with you. Yes, uh, on the way in this morning, we got an alarm because, um, uh, what's the location, Ev? Yeah, Shining Bank Fire, and that location got, uh, we're told to evacuate out of there. So we're still having those kind of alarms up there. Fortunately, we, we, we got back into our town. When I left Edson during that, the sky was that color, my iPad. And it was an eerie time. Fortunately, God sent rain, and we're asking him to do again the same. Thank you for your prayers. We appreciate that. Well, to, to orientate us to what I want to speak about today, it's in John chapter 5, if you want to find that in your Bibles. Um, I had a privilege this year. I had another first. In February, I made a trip to Israel. I was privileged to visit Israel. This brought back, this brought to me, of course, a very fresh perspective on Easter this year. And uh, reading about the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, Gethsemane, Caiaphas' house, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Pilate's uh, Praetorium, Golgotha, the Garden Tomb, uh, those are not just words on a page anymore. They're vivid memories in my mind. If you've never gone there, I would encourage you to perhaps take a look at that. So this morning, I'd like to take you to another site found in the middle of all those traditional Easter sites. We won't be able to go there physically unless, of course, the rapture happens in the next half hour. Uh, but we can go there through our Bibles, and that, that's in John chapter 5. We've already talked about that. Open, uh, in John chapter 5, this is about Jesus' remarkable visit to the pool of Bethesda, or some translations say Bethsaida. This pool is just a few paces away from where Pilate uh, released Jesus to be crucified. It's really close. So as I read John chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 18, I want you to listen for three statements that Jesus makes. He makes three statements here, and those are important. We want to take a look at those today. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, uh, probably Passover, oh, of course Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate pool, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, or some translations say Bethsaida, which has a five, five roof colonnades, and in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Some manuscripts omit this, but you will also have some that will say, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool 
and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. I think it's important to make a comment here. Some translations include this verse, some translations do not. The reason they do not is that they think it's a possibility that this was an editorial comment by a scribe. He's telling us what was going on here. That's possible. It's also possible that the dinner bell rang at the previous verse, and when he came back, he forgot where he was. Uh, that's equally possible because all of these were transcribed by hand. So I think it's appropriate that it is included. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When, if you're not 38 yet, or you just are, this man had been there longer than you have lived. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man, man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath, and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, well, who was the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answers them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God. Father, as we look into this scripture this morning, I pray that you would be our teacher. Open our hearts to the truth that you have there for us, and may we respond in faith, I pray. Amen. If you were observant, you will notice that Jesus makes three statements, right? What's the first one? Do you want to be healed? Shortly thereafter, second one, get up your bed and walk. And the third one, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Jesus asks a question. He gives a command and concludes with an exhortation. For the brief time that we have here this morning, we want to look at these three uh, statements of Jesus. Why were they important to this man? And why are they important to you and I? But let, first, let me give you context. The pool Bethesda, Bethesda, whichever one translation you have, is described as having five porticles, a puzzling feature suggesting a five-sided pool, to which many scholars in the past dismissed it as an un It's not historical. It's an unliteral, uh, not a literary... Er not literal creation. Yet when this site was evacuated, or not evacuated, I got that mind, word in my mind, <laughs> excavated, it revealed a rectangular pool with two basins, one here and then a, a wall and, and another one lower. And on the top pool, there were two porticles, and on the bottom pool, there were three. So it actually was a pool with five porticles, five-sided. It's kind of like a, a lean-to on the side of that, or a porch overlooking the pool. I visited the site, and it is accurate. Today, the location of the pool Bethesda is to be found in the Muslim quarter of Old Jerusalem City, just north of the Temple Mount. If this is the Temple Mount, the pool of Bethesda is just a few, sta a few paces away from the steps leading up to that mount. It was called, it was near the Sheep Gate, about 50 paces also from the Sheep Gate. That was the, 
the, the wall that went around the old city, and it was called a sheep gate because that's where they brought the sheep because that was closest to the temple. And they brought the sheep through that gate that they used for the sacrifices in the temple. It's adjacent to the temple mount. And so when Jesus healed the paralytic and told him to pick up his dead and bed and walk, it would have been just a short distance, not much farther from the back of this uh, building uh, to the temple mount wall or steps for him to make his way up into the temple. And of course, remember, for th anybody who is, has a defect is a not allowed into the temple complex. For 38 years, he would not have been able to go in there. And obviously, he wanted to go in there. And so that's the first place that he went. And it was the Sabbath. People were gathering for worship. And so we can assume that that's, that is where he met the Jews who said, it's not lawful for you to carry something on the Sabbath. And so you shouldn't be carrying that when you come in here. And of course, Jesus used this miracle to expose two false beliefs. Two false beliefs, and re and, but also to reveal where true faith and true belief is to be found. And so this scripture is really about how God's power comes to man. The first false belief that Jesus addressed was the legalistic approach of the Jews, who said that God would be displeased if you carried anything on the Sabbath. The Greek word used here, translated Jews, refers specifically to the Jewish religious leaders and those who were under their influence. Their view was that you can earn God's favor by meticulously, meticulously keeping His laws. But Jesus, this miracle that Jesus performed on that day brought confrontation with the religious police over their interpretation of the Sabbath command. God initially gave the Sabbath as a blessing. But the Jews had turned it into a religious burden. It was a hard day. It was not a relaxing day. Obviously, Jesus didn't agree with their interpretation because he commanded the man to pick up his bed and walk on the Sabbath. The second false belief system was religious superstition. The name Bethesda is a kind of play on words. It means house of grace or the house of the outpouring. A curious blend of Hebrew religion and Greek superstition held that an angel of God would per periodically stir the waters and this would bring healing to the first person who was able to jump in the pool. That's typical of any religion that Satan promotes. This one was especially cruel. When you stop and think about it, the one who would benefit the most from a healing would be the one most least likely to make it into the pool. We now know that the pool was fed by underground springs that periodically flowed faster than other times. But Jesus chose this occasion to expose this false belief. It was a false superstition that had nothing to do with God and His ways of healing. Jesus' statements in this chapter, therefore, are a demonstration of how God's power comes to mankind. So let's take a closer look at Jesus' three statements. <clears throat> the first one, Jesus asks, do you want to be healed? Now, this fellow had been an invalid for 38 years. One would think that that would be a senseless question. Of course this man wanted to be healed. So why would Jesus ask such a question? What was he up to in these verses? Now, in that day and age, those that wanted to grab the attention of a crowd uh, were usually masters of special effects. In Jesus' day, one would tell a story, or if they could, do something supernatural. And here we see, of course, Jesus being understanding the culture, but also, he had a multitude of agendas that he would accomplish in this one act. Typical of his work among mankind. He obviously knew what was going on in this man's heart. And he reached out to him in his need. But he also used this uh, opportunity as a powerful object lesson. 
for those who would take notice. Perhaps in his mind, the pool represents the world. Around it lay desperately sick people, waiting to, for the opportunity, for the chance to participate in a pathetic race of empty hope for their desperate need. Jesus was demonstrating that the source of life and healing for all mankind was to be found in Him. Man's great need was not to be found in superstitious religion or in legalistic religion. It was to be found in Him. And so, therefore, Jesus' question is not meaningless. I am sure all of us here today could list numerous people who we know who have great needs but are unwilling that they need to some kind of change to bring about a change in their life. They're not ready to admit that. They need to change if they're going to find victory over their struggles. And it's only the desperate that are willing to cry out to God for mercy. A couple of well-known scriptures would perhaps point this out. Consider, for example, Jesus, the Beatitudes. Jesus' first Beatitude, of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5, 3. What did he say? Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit means bankrupt in spirit. Jesus was pointing out those who admit that they are bankrupt spiritually and a condition before God and they have a great need and acknowledge that for God, for, before God are already in the kingdom. The prophet Jeremiah expressed the same truth to the nation of Israel. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Not part of your heart. All your heart. All your heart. And so what Jesus asked this man is what he asks of you and I. What he asks is of all of us. Will you come to me in your need? Sinful pride prevents that attitude of heart. Repentance and humility permit it. Do you want to be healed? That moves us on to Jesus' second statement in verse 8. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. What did the man do? <laughs> the scripture, Mark tells us that once the man was healed, he took up his bed and he walked. Now, for 38 years, this man had laid in, laid in that condition. If somebody else had made that statement to him, he would have thought that they were cruel or insane but not now. Immediately, he responded. The scriptures say at once, no hesitation. Now, we need to, need to stop and ponder this remarkable response for a bit. For 38 years, this man had not moved those limbs. His lack of movement had become so habitual, his muscles had atrophied, that he did not even think of trying. But this response was immediate to Jesus' command. This was not just a physical miracle. This was psychological, spiritual, behavioral, and obviously emotional. Jesus is such a wonderful healer. We're not giving any explanation of what was going on in this man's heart and mind other than he immediately obeyed Jesus and he experienced God's power at work. But it does show us one thing. When we get to the point where we are desperate and we know that we are spiritually bankrupt, we are opening to hearing God's voice. Jesus himself said this. If you remember in John 10, he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. If you are here this morning and conscious of your great need and reaching out to God, may I remind you to consider who made that promise. 
Jesus never lies. Do you believe that? Let's go to a couple of other scriptures that explain how God's power comes to us when we seek Him in our need. You can turn to those scriptures, or perhaps, if you're familiar with the Bible, you may just use your memory. The first one is Hebrews 11:6. You seem to be a responsive crowd, so let's use it. And without faith, possible to, to please God. For whoever would seek... That's right. Draw near to God must believe that He exists and He rewards those who seek Him. That's another different translation. It says the same thing. So what pleases God? Faith. That's right. What do we need to do if we're going to draw near to God? Believe that He exists and that He rewards those that diligently, there's the word diligently again, all your heart, those who diligently seek Him. A serious question to consider for us all this morning. Do you believe that God is, He exists, and He rewards those who diligently seek Him? I would suspect you do, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. But if this is all new to you, this is important to listen up. If your life is moving you down Pleasant Street, you may be aware of that truth. But if your life has you going down Desperate Street, you are drawn to that truth. If you are going through a tough time right now in life, that could could turn out to be God's gift to you. If you wish to draw near to God and experience His power, then it's essential that you admit your need, that you believe He exists, and He rewards those who diligently seek Him. We don't know what was going on in this man's heart, but obviously it did not contradict these truths. Our needs commend us to God. You and I are probably not going to demonstrate true faith until we are convinced of our inability to meet our needs and that only God can. God may have created your certain current circumstances to open your eyes to your need and to His provision for that need. And so it's time for you to listen up. Listen for His voice and obey it when you hear. Remember, God has promised that you will find Him when you seek Him with all your heart. Now to another scripture that reveals how we experience God's power. It's found in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And again, if you're familiar with your Bibles, I'm sure you know the scripture, scripture. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. For salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, it came to the Jew first, Jesus was a Jew, and also for the Greek or the non-Jew. For in the righteousness of God, for the right, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith through faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's take time to unpack the truths embedded in that Scripture. How does God po God's power come to us? It comes to us through the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel in the New Testament is the good news of Jesus. He lived. He died to pay a debt we could not pay. And what is that debt? Well, the Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Sin cuts us off from the power of God. Jesus paid the debt for that sin so that by a word we've used here quite a bit this morning, by His grace, we may have access to Him. Grace, as one man has put it, an acrostic, G-R-A-C-E, God's, God's riches at Christ's expense. I don't deserve it, but He wants to give it. He's chosen to give it. 
Who does this salvation of Jesus Christ or the power of God come to? As that verse says, to everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. All who place their faith in Christ receive forgiveness of sin and the life or the power of God. Eternal life is the power of God at work in us. These are the ones who hear His voice and follow Him. As we seek Him, as we believe Him, trust Him, and obey His voice, He promises to release His power to us and to grant us eternal life. And may I remind you, eternal life is not something just for the future. If it's in you now, you have eternal life, and He wants to give you the benefits of that life. The good thing about it, it never ends. Never ends. Sounds like a good deal to me, right? That's a very good deal. But it is also a life you can only get from God. So consequently, you must be in relationship with Him. Therefore, you must seek Him alone for His power. And He says you are to do that with all your heart. And Jesus rose from the grave demonstrating that He has the power over sin, which has separated you from God. And he's the power over death. Once you have eternal life, death is no longer an enemy. It's a servant. Physical death ushers you into the presence of God. Boy, that's victory. That's victory. And of course, this power is a power over all the consequences of sin. Not just death, which includes sickness and infirmity. So as we pause to think about this, it seems too good to be true. We struggle to believe this, and we're not alone. All humanity has wrestled with this ever since the Garden of Eden. The question they have always asked is, how can a holy God... Forgive and accept and have fellowship with sinners and still be holy. You got to get holy. The world religion says, you got to work for it. Do everything so God can accept you. The gospel says no. The gospel is the only answer to that age-old question. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ, only God's life can meet that need and the need that you and I all have. So how does the righteousness of God come to us? Romans 1.17 explains. Now we're getting into the last, the last statement. We'll explain that in a moment. For in it it says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith or faith through faith as some translations say. As, as it is written, the righteous shall live. Keep on living by faith. Notice there are two very important steps to this divine transaction. It must be revealed, and it only comes to those who exercise faith. Now, this gospel runs contrary to all the human instincts of fallen humanity. All re false religions, all world religions, ever since the Garden of Eden, actually, say we must earn God's favor. That was the belief of the legalistic Jews and the false superstition of those around the pool of Bethesda. They would have said, you must behave to receive. That explains why the radical departure from human convention and human wisdom has to be revealed. It has to be revealed. And it also explains why this man's healing, healing required supernatural power. But the essential reason of why the unfolding mystery must be revealed is that a spiritual reality from the spiritual world comes from the spiritual world and not the physical world. And so the kind of righteousness that God demands and provides is only revealed through faith in the hearts of those who believe the good news of Jesus Christ that He came to do what He came to do for us. 
That's why salvation from sin and, its, and the consequences of sin must be God's work from start to finish. That's why the false religious beliefs could not bring healing to this man. One more important point before we move on to Jesus' last statement in John 5. This revelation comes to us from faith to faith. Does this sound like a one-time event? No, it's ongoing. Faith in Jesus Christ is a living faith, demands a living faith. It, yes, it comes to us. It becomes a reality in our life when we bend the knee in repentance and humility. We come before the cross as one of the songs we sang earlier this morning. We come to the cross of Jesus. And remember, before the cross of Jesus, the ground is level. doesn't matter if you're wealthy or you're poor. doesn't matter whether you're well-educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter if you have social standing or no social standing. doesn't matter whether you can control substances or your addiction. It doesn't matter. You all stand on level ground. It's all the same before Jesus. What a beautiful gift. What a beautiful gift. And so therefore, that faith that we have in Jesus must continue on until we hear him say that wonderful day, come you are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For 38 years, this man had lain beside the pool Was he seeking God? What did he pray that morning at the pool? We don't know. But we do know that when he heard Jesus' voice, he obeyed immediately. He obeyed immediately. Those are precious, powerful moments when we hear the voice of Jesus and we respond in a faith and obedience. That's the moment when God's power is revealed to your heart. They are life-changing moments. Have you heard that voice? If not, I pray you do so this morning. Now to Jesus' last statement, verse 14 of our text. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. What does this verse tell us? Well, on first reading, we might assume this man's physical problems came because of a specific sin in his past life. That's possible. But I think Jesus was just was staying on cue here. And he was talking about the spiritual condition of man's needs in general. Let me take a couple of questions here to explain what is meant by this exhortation to this man who was an invalid, was now healed. This man had just experienced a profound miracle of God's power. If believing and obeying Jesus is the doorway to God's righteous power, what is the greatest sin and tragedy of man? Not believing that truth. Unbelief, rejection, or self-confidence. That kind of attitude that says, I got this, God, I don't need you. Such an attitude is foolish. Because Jesus alone is the one who holds the key to the power of God. Earlier that day, this man who had obeyed Jesus' voice, he experienced the power of God at work. And so what Jesus was doing, he was inviting this man to keep on believing that voice of God. Keep on and trusting in Him. To continue to do this all the way down the road of life. Don't give up doing what you have done. Keep on doing it. And why is this important? Because only Jesus can bring the power of God to you and I. If you try some other path, you're not going to find it. Keep on believing. If you stop believing, something worse can happen to you. That's, and of course, that means that that matter, that bit, that challenge to keep on believing Jesus remains true no matter what stage of, of your journey of faith you are on in life. It still is true. So in John chapters, in John, really chapters 5 through 12 of the gospel, those of you familiar with the gospel will know that Jesus uses a, a number of signs. 
Signs to demonstrate that He is the promised Messiah, the ultimate one, uh, the last two, of course, His death on our behalf and His resurrection was the ultimate sign. Each sign identifies the Son of God more clearly than the one before it until the truth is unmistakably clear in willing hearts that are prepared to receive it. They see it. Who saw the resurrected Christ? Only those who believe. Others were angered at His words. Their hearts preferred pride and prejudice. And so we see that the truth of God's Word often divides more than it unites in a broken world, becoming increasingly so in our world. As I reflected on the events of this chapter, I perceive that the location of the pool of Bethesda is noteworthy. It's really halfway between the garden tomb and the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will return once again and His feet touch earth. Illustrating that once again Jesus died and rose again, that we might leave death and the grave and experience the resurrection where He ascended. The truth about life is that we are all lying beside some pool in desperate need. And Jesus is passing by. Are we going to hear His voice and keep on obeying Him? Or is our heart going to remain captured by pride and prejudice? Perhaps I should frame that question a little differently. Life is often complex and full of mystery. What if at the beginning of your life, God presented you with an option? You can journey through life with pleasure and contentment, but that will lead you to ignore me and the life I alone can give you. Or... You can hear my voice and experience my healing, resurrection, power, and eternal life, but it will mean that you will have to remain an invalid for 38 years. Which would you choose? I'm glad he never gives us that option. You might say that's an unfair question. Mm, agreed. But then again, life in this world is never fair. Ask the people of Ukraine. Or the people whose house just burned down. The question we must all face is this. Do I want what I want? Or do I want what God wants? As we bring our time to close this morning, let's bow our heads in prayer. Prayerfully ask yourself this question. Who is Jesus to me? Remember, God's power, power flows to those who seek Him with all their heart. As our heads are bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here this morning, you've never responded to Jesus to be your Savior, to save you from your sins, but you want to. As your heads are all bowed, if you, if you would just raise your head and look at me, I want to pray for you. For those of you that would be in that category, quietly, silently, in your heart, pray this prayer. 
Remember, Jesus knows your heart. Believe he exists. And that he wants to minister to you. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I've gone my own way. I need help. Forgive me for my sin. Lord Jesus, I want to give my life to you. I want you to cleanse my heart. Make it a place fit for your dwelling. Help me to turn from sin and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for that wonderful gift. I know I'm not worthy of it, but I am grateful for it. If you prayed that prayer, please come and talk to me afterwards. For the rest of you, perhaps you've trusted the Lord Jesus to be your Savior, but you've kind of been sidelined. Perhaps you're discouraged or hanging on to what you might think is a secret sin. Remember, Jesus sees everything. Perhaps you're just simply resisting Jesus' calls to obedience. He's inviting you this morning, right now, to keep coming to Him. As you, Where you sit, just talk to Him about your desire to seek Him. Let's just take a few moments for you to do that. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you meet with us corporately. Yes, we've sensed your presence here today. But I also want to thank you that you meet with us individually. You have heard all these prayers today. I pray that you would extend your grace. I pray that people would seek you with a whole heart. Your power would come to enable them to do that. And they would trust you. And this would just be the beginning of an increasing journey of faith and trust in you until you take us all home. Thank you for these wonderful words. Thank you for your wonderful way that you work amongst us. We love you. You are worthy of our love. Thank you. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.